Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Twine. I'm uh, co-director of the Center for Human Animal Studies alongside Claire, based at Edgehill University in Northwest England. I'm talking to you from uh, my home in Lancaster, uh, Lancashire, Northwest England uh, this morning or this evening, perhaps. If you're in Australia, it's nice for us to be able to uh, have a morning uh, seminar to accommodate people from uh, Australasia today. So this is the third of six seminars that we are hosting this year. Um, the, the first two are already on our YouTube channel and uh, we're really happy to have uh, Thea uh, talk for us today. Our next talk will be in September with uh, Helena Pedersen. All those details are on our website. Okay, so Thea Brooks Preback is an independent scholar based in the, in the Blue Mountains, lovely Blue Mountains, which I've had the pleasure of visiting before in New South Wales, Australia. She's also a multidisciplinary artist. And uh, as somebody's already alluded to, she also uh, keeps sheep um, in the Blue Mountains, uh, rescued sheep. And uh, Thea is the author of the award-winning 2021 book, Enter the Animal, Cross-Species Perspectives in Grief and Spirituality. And obviously this is a topic to which she's going to speak um, with us today. And that's part of the Animal Public series uh, with Sydney University Press. And uh, last year, she was also the author of uh, Not Just Another Vegan Cookbook, uh, which is uh, a really interesting looking cookbook. And uh, Thea tells me she specializes in vegan cheeses. And I've put links to not just the uh, Enter the Animal book, but also there's a YouTube link to uh, the cookbook as well. And there's also a link to Thea's uh, own website in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Thea and um, maybe approximately 45 minutes, um, that, that kind of time. And then obviously we will have time for discussion, conversation, questions uh, afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's a real honor. I looked at your centers. I mean, I've heard about your center before, obviously, but I had a closer look at your website and I really like all your projects. And I was talking to Claire before, in particular the storytelling because I've been sort of thinking in that area lately. Um, I'm sorry that Paula can't be with us. Uh, Paula is another member of the center, um, but the, um, yeah, well, anyway, she, she was going to be a bit chicken and um, I'm reading her book at the moment and I'm liking it a lot. So I'm gonna uh, share the screen now because I've got some slides here to make it slightly more interesting, hopefully. Okay, you, there you go. Okay, so um, this grief research was somehow accidental. I was an activist and I was finding my advocacy inadequate. I needed to know more about non-human animals and this whole discourse of rights and liberation. And so I thought a PhD in something animal related could help. So I was well aware of the physical suffering and it was also clear to me that if we don't stop using them, we can't stop the suffering because profit will always have priority of a welfare and um, their actual well-being. So I was a vegan and I turned vegan in 2006, but I had no idea how complex other animals truly are, you know, mentally, socially, that they are completely comparable to humans in everything that <clears throat> matters. So, oh, someone's got. Yeah, uh, it's the same. It's the data. Then speaking. Thanks. Excuse me. Can you ah. you mute your microphone, please? Um, okay. So, okay, Taylor, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I was, I was aware of all that, but I had no idea how complex it truly were. And of course, for a long time, the topic of animal subjectivity was banned across disciplines. So, you know, people could lose jobs and careers, and so most didn't go there. Other aspects of non-human animals were considered, but as it happens, people come to the research with certain assumptions, now we all do. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, <laughs> not guilty of this. And, and these assumptions will influence what we look for and, of course, eventually also what we find. 
For example, primates were thought to be more complex compared to others. So researchers have spent a lot of time trying to work out just how complex they are. Now, sheep, on the other hand, weren't considered complex, so no one was looking into their complexity. And as a result, we don't have much data on sheep complexity, but that doesn't mean that they're not complex. It just means that we haven't looked for it. And similarly, when we consider various behavioral aspects, for example, research, but also documentaries, tended to focus on more dramatic stuff like aggression and reproduction and ignore cooperative and loving relationships, which are actually more common among animals. But if you're constantly watching or reading about aggression and competition, then you end up thinking that that's all they do. And so we've ended up with a pretty distorted picture of other animals' worlds and of their being. And I found all this incredibly fascinating. So my thesis and then the book started to grow in multiple directions because I was basically explaining things to myself, trying to answer my own questions as they emerged. Um, I was basically now, I see it as a kind of textbook that I needed to read. I don't know about others, but you know, I needed to read this stuff as an activist, but also as a consumer and basically just as someone who lives on a shared planet. So I won't be able to capture this complexity in 40 minutes, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of it anyway. I'll focus on grief, and I do hope that you find some of it useful. I'm going to begin with my sheep, um, Henry, Jonathan, Jason, and Pumpkin. And Pumpkin's not here, but you'll, you'll meet him later. I spend a lot of time with them every day, and they are a constant source of inspiration and information. And the more time I spend with them, the more I see into their world. Now, we've been together for 10 years, so I know them pretty well, but I still have the feeling that I'm really only just scratching the surface, that there's so much more there that is totally inaccessible to me. For example, there'll be a scent that travels past. Now, I can't smell a thing, but you know, suddenly they lift their noses and their ears go up. They're definitely receiving some kind of information, and I go like, what is it that you're smelling? What do you know that I don't? And so there's so much of their world, obviously not just my sheep's world, but all other animals' worlds, will always remain a mystery, especially their conceptual worlds, you know, their thoughts, their interpretations, and so on. But their emotional domain is a bit more predictable because of our shared organismic infrastructure and processes. And that was another area that I found totally fascinating when I was working on my PhD, you know, the insights from effective neuroscience and information processing and so on. And how we've gone from thinking that everything that is of any relevance all happens in certain higher and newer brain regions. You know, emotions were considered to be a form of thought. Yeah. So and if you need the curls on the left you know to feel emotions then it would be reasonable to assume that the brain on the right won't be able to do it or at least not to the same extent but what we've learned is that in effect most of what matters experientially happens in more ancient parts of the brain and these parts are way more similar across species you know, compared to this outer newer layers and this is also valid for the experiences of attachment and loss and a lot of what we know about underlying processes, we've actually learned from cruel experiments on um, other animals. So when it comes to grief, what I try to do with my research was to bring the discussion back to the emotional aspects of loss, because essentially grief is an organismic response to loss. And the reason we can experience grief is because we are animals, not despite of the fact that we are animals because we have an animal body and an animal brain, and they both develop in relation. We need relations the way we need food and water. So when we are born or hatched, if we're not mammals, our brain is not fully formed. It will continue to develop with the help of the caregivers and the socio-natural environment. And the quality of care we receive will determine how it develops. You know, animals are primed for such implicit communication with subjects around us. We are prone to attach to them because we need them. You know, emotional attachments are literally vital to us in these early stages, and they continue to be important for the rest of our lives. And grief is an inevitable consequence of the loss of an attachment figure, of an important attachment 
So humans normally recognize that other animals have the capacity to experience grief, but then two things normally happen. First, I'm not entirely sure that we realize how bad it can get for them. You know, the emotional response can be quite acute, but it can also become chronic. And so to <clears throat> appreciate the potency or the potential potency of loss, it helps to understand the importance of attachment relations. And so I spent a bit of time learning about attachment and I will go into more detail shortly. And forgive me if you're already familiar with this material. I find that a lot of people, unless they're psychologists, they're not. And it was certainly quite a revelation to me when I first came across it. And the second thing that happens is that after we recognize that the feeling of grief is possible for other animals, we tend to quickly shift the focus to the, to the cognitive domain and to more philosophical questions like, do they understand death? Do they know they're mortal? And so on. And these are certainly very interesting questions and they may color the experience of grief in certain ways, but having a human-like understanding of these things is not a prerequisite for grief. And the main problem is that when humans start to answer these questions, most will determine that other animals don't understand death and mortality or that they don't understand it the way we do. And very quickly it starts, starts to sound like it's not just these conceptual things that are different, but the emotion itself is also different. And that of course usually means that other animals' emotions, you know, their grief is less intense and, and ultimately less important compared to humans' grief. And I think this is not a valid position. Other animals' experience of grief is completely comparable to ours. Of course, there will be differences, but there will be individual differences, not species differences. A bit like physical pain, individuals have different levels of tolerance and so on. So my grief will be different from your grief or from a cow's grief because we are different people, because we are individuals with different psychological constitutions, because the, the nature of the lost relationship was different, and because of other subjective and circumstantial factors, but not because I'm a human and she is a cow. Now, I must also say that a lot of time people who raise these questions don't actually analyze them. They just sort of opinions, you know, something you toss around when you talk about animal grief or other emotions um, to sound so called more um, objective. There's actually also this assumption that there's some kind of universal human understanding of these questions and even a universal behavioral response, and, and that's not the case. So I'm gonna run through some of these common satellite issues first, and then we'll look at attachment more closely. People often equate feeling and expression. They think that if there's feeling, there should be expression. And if there's no feeling, oh sorry, if there's no expression, there's no feeling because that's how things work in the human world, except when they don't. A lot of the time, feeling and expression of the feeling go together, but not always, you know, even with humans. There's also the possibility that humans don't recognize a certain expression as an expression of grief in other animals. Now, death is a common thing in, in the non-human animal world, but we don't witness it firsthand very often, and we don't often get the opportunity to observe other animals' reactions to death of uh, family members or friends or even you know, others. We're not close enough to them, to most animals, you know, both physically and psychologically close, perhaps companion animals are an exception, to be able to detect nuances that may be indicative of grief. And unless the expression of grief is very emphatic and of a kind that is familiar to us, we can easily miss it or you know, attribute it some other feeling. So, Across cultures, humans have very different ways of expressing and repressing grief. Now, if we were to rely on behavioral cues alone, a lot of the time we may wonder about the nature or even the existence of grief in some other humans. So we have societies that, that are more stoic and people are expected to repress pain. And we have societies that encourage emphatic outer expression and again, this expression can be intense weeping, but it can also be dancing, drinking, even you know, laughing and fighting. And just because someone, a neighbor, for example, 
is weeping and wailing, it doesn't mean that she is grieving. It could just mean that that's what she's supposed to do because she's a neighbor or a wife or a husband or whatever. And so here we have got um, two different human approaches to funerals. And we tend to forget about these differences when we talk about non-human animals. You know, when we see something that we don't recognize, humans may go, oh no, we don't do this around corpses. Their grief must be different from ours. And perhaps they don't even mean that when they say it. Maybe they mean expression, not grief, you know, not the feeling. But the choice of wording is pretty important, especially when you're discussing a population that can't defend itself you know, verbally. And it's similar when it comes to burials, like some human societies bury their dead, others don't, some eat them, some store them away for a while, and so on. And if other animals don't do anything with a corpse or do seemingly weird things um, with, with a corpse, that doesn't necessarily say much about their grief. <clears throat> and then there are additional issues that are rarely considered when discussing non-human grief so-called delayed personhood is um, one such thing. So in human societies with high infant mortality, there's a tendency to try to not attach to the child until the child is old enough and there's a higher chance that uh, they'll survive. And it's a coping mechanism that you employ just to be able to survive yourself. You know, it doesn't mean that you're always successful at it. It's, um, it's a very complicated phenomenon, but something similar may be happening in other animal societies with high mortality or for separation of close others, which is just about any animal society, really. And becoming used to it and adjusting one's behavior to this repeated separation, to this losses, doesn't mean that one doesn't suffer, that, that they don't grieve. And the other problem with expression is that displays of vulnerability can attract the attention of predators and there's a pressing need to hide and to get over pain as soon as possible. So in some ways, mourning that the expression of grief, not, not the feeling, could be viewed as a privilege of animal persons living in more stable and safe environments. Um, another question that comes up when humans discuss discuss other animals' grief is the understanding of death and mortality, as mentioned earlier. So when it comes to mortality and fear of death, people tend to forget that when humans lose a close other, our first reaction usually isn't, oh my God, I'm going to die one day too, what a tragedy that's going to be. When people lose someone they love, they may find it hard to carry on with their own lives. And many recover eventually, but some don't, and they also die soon after. Um, there are some theoretical frameworks that help to explain this, and we'll get to them a bit later. But at some fundamental level, all animals fear death and try to avoid it. Now, how they understand death, that's another question. And humans would often assume that there's only one way to understand death, basically, as annihilation. I die, and that's the end of me. But this is actually a minority view because most humans even in the West, view death as some kind of transformation. And this whole cognitive and interpretive level can actually help cope with grief rather than making grief worse, especially when you have religious explanations that you know, promise you to reunite with your loved one or, or that life over there is much better than this one and so on. But that aside, being able to tell a dead organism, whatever that may mean philosophically to other animals from a live one, is a rather important thing in all animals' lives. You know, telling a dead lion from a sleeping lion if I'm his potential dinner is rather advantageous. Now, this is not a lion, this is my sweet Henry. But, or, you know, telling a dead child from a sleeping child, it informs energy investment and all sorts of things. So from a practical perspective, you know, because ultimately animals do live in a very real world, not just in our labs and in our imagination, it's unlikely that other animals wouldn't understand this, at least as permanent cessation of agency. So when my Charlie died, for example, and Charlie was a dog and he had a very close relationship um, with the sheep, his Charlie. So when he died of uh, cancer, I wanted to make sure that the sheep knew that he was dead and he didn't just like vanish or I did something terrible to him or whatever. So I took Charlie's body into my arms and I took him to the sheep. And one by one, they came close to him 
and jumped off immediately. Like all four of them did exactly the same thing. So they knew Charlie was dead. They must have smelled something. And I obviously don't know what that meant to them, what death is in you know, sheep head, but they definitely knew. So um, anyway, as it happens, there's been some definitional problems in the world of human grief as well. And Colin Parks, who's studied human grief for over 50 years, points out that the variables that people may associate with grief, such as depression, anger, self-reproach, threat to our own security, fear of death, and so on, can happen in other circumstances too. They're not necessarily related to grief. And conversely, you can have grief without feeling any of these. And so Parks aptly proposed to focus on separation distress and specifically his basic definition of grief is the experience of a loss and a reaction of intense pining and yearning for the object lost, separation, anxiety, basically. Without this, he says, a person cannot be said to be grieving. And this definition is suitable for the cross pieces context as well. And if we focus on attachment and separation distress, then the picture changes dramatically. And I believe that it becomes clear that the differences manifest on an individual level rather than on a species level. A bit like physical pain, which also depends on various factors, you know, some constitutional, others circumstantial. For example, if I'm in a good mood, my broken leg is not gonna be so painful, which I always thought was interesting. But you know, for the time being, we're really only talking about mammals and birds where this kind of attachment process has been confirmed. But as you've probably heard, there's increasing evidence of intimate behavior and loving relationships and attachment in, in others as well. Um, so attachment theory, excuse me. John Bowlby, was uh, the one who pioneered detachment theory and his theoretical work benefited substantially from the empirical work of his colleague, Mary Ainsworth. Uh, Myron Hoffer, who is a researcher and a psychiatrist wrote that one of John Bowlby's great contributions has been to place attachment and loss in the perspectives of development and evolution. Now, for Hoffer and others, this means that they can study attachment and loss in experiments on non-human animals and then infer the findings to humans while conveniently ignoring the pain of other animals. But anyway, Bowlby began work in the area of infant caregiver separation in the 1950s. At the time, it was recognized that absence of intimacy had a negative impact on the infants, but how this happened and why it happened wasn't very clear. So socially deprived children, such as children in orphanages, were not thriving emotionally and cognitively, even when they received high quality physical care and good nutrition. Then Harry Harlow conducted invasive experiments on rhesus monkeys, and these experiments provided further evidence of negative impacts of early social deprivation. So Harlow removed baby monkeys from their biological mothers and exposed them to surrogates. And he had two types of surrogates. A surrogate that was made of wire mesh and was very hard and unpleasant, that's the one on the left, and a soft surrogate made of cloth. Now, the interesting thing was that the infants attached to the cloth mother, even when the wire mother, so-called, was the only one to provide food. They ate from them from her, but you know that was it. And you can see the infant here in, um, under the uh, cloth mother on the right. And this was a bit of a surprise at the time because contemporary theories of attachment were centered around food acquisition. Let's move on to some happy monkeys. Now, the other thing that these experiments and many others later, they still do them, what they also showed was that this deprivation of intimacy, and in some cases, direct abuse, didn't, didn't only affect the babies themselves, the direct recipients of this abuse or negligence, but it also transferred across generations to their own offspring. So for example, if I'm raised by an abusive caregiver, I'm likely to become abusive to my own offspring, even if my biological parents were loving people. And vice versa, if I come from abusive biological parents, but I'm raised by loving people, 
I'm likely to be loving to my kids. So the big surprise was that so-called nurture was so powerful compared to so-called nature. Now, to Bowlby, all this indicated that attachment relations and social bonds play a far more critical role than it had been imagined and way beyond nutrition. And then Bowlby came across his logical work, particularly Conrad Lawrence and, and the phenomenon of imprinting in precocial avian species. Now, Lawrence was working with geese, but these are our little ducklings here from the pond. So precocial animals are mobile at birth and are able to feed themselves. So they're not as dependent on the parents as altricial animals are. But even precocial birds have an innate tendency to attach, to imprint. And this enabled Bolwick to envision the possibility that attachment may work in a similar fashion also in mammals, including humans, of course, because he was working uh, largely with humans or concerned by humans principally. So that both the infant and the caregiver are predisposed to form this attachments and that these attachments have serious biological value. And so research over the following decades has confirmed this. It's demonstrated among other things that the primary caregiver, which is usually the mother, but you know, it could be someone else, plays a crucial role in the development of the infant's brain and psychobiological regulation. And this is a pretty big thing, or at least it was for me when I discovered it. So when we are born or hatched, our brain and our psychological and biological self-regulation are still developing. And so the brain and the patterns it forms are dependent on experience. So what the little animals experience in these early stages will influence how our brain develops and how it gets wired. So the caregiver is a source of stimuli to which the infant responds. But at the same time, the caregiver is also a superstructure that guides the infant's responses. So basically, the caregiver functions as an external regulator of the infant's internal states. Now, Ideally, the caregiver will be able to soothe the baby animal if the baby is upset and maximize the baby's happy states. So if my caregiver successfully regulates a negative arousal state that I'm experiencing, this teaches me that negative states can be dealt with, that they can be tolerated and regulated. And this is not going into my autobiographical memory because the brain is not fully formed yet. And that's why it's hard to access it. You, know, you need to later. So it goes directly into the rest of my system. Um, it, um, it's sort of in the long run, successful regulation leads to adaptive physical and mental health and vice versa. If the caregiver can't help baby me overcome a negative state, I learned that regulation is difficult um, or even impossible. And all this will then affect my internal system, my levels of anxiety and so on, but also how the individual is, you know, how I am in relation to the outside world, such as like my, my social competencies. And if we look at the autonomic nervous system, which I think is an interesting example. So the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that supplies internal organs for heart, lungs, bladder, kidneys, and so on. So it, it regulates certain body processes such as blood pressure, breathing rates, digestion, and others. And it does so automatically, autonomously, without our intentional help. The developmental context affects how an individual's autonomic system will respond to stressful events and situations. So if we grow up in an adverse environment, like if we are subjected to abuse or even just neglect, our organism can become sensitized to stressors. It can make it hyper reactive and not very efficient in dealing with challenging circumstances. So the sympathetic branch, the fight or flight response can become dominant. And that can lead to animals that are hypervigilant, anxious, aggressive, and have various physical and psychological issues. Um, it um, affects the resilience of animals' immune systems, for example, and it makes us more prone to inflammation later in life. So the infant's primary aim in this initial period of life is to establish an emotional communication with the caregiver so that the infant can continue to develop these um, essentials. And based on our early experience in the world, animals form so-called internal working models. And these are mental representations of the self, the socio-natural environment, 
and the self in relation to this environment. And we also form attachment styles. <clears throat> now, the insecure attachment style there is perhaps of most interest because it's more likely to lead to complicated grief and I'll, I'll get to this shortly. But essentially, the caregiver's responses provide the infant with a mountain of critical information about the self. The infant will learn whether they're worthy of love or not, whether help is available or not, and so on. And of course, everyone's worthy of love, but that's not how the infant and then the infant turned adult will feel if they get you know, signals from the caregivers to the contrary. And Daniel Siegel has this beautiful way of putting it. We first know ourselves as reflected in the other. And by self here, I mean the experiential self, not the reflective self. So not the self that thinks the self, writes essays about it and so on, but the self that feels the self. It's a self that perhaps has different kinds, but doesn't have degrees. It feels itself fully in its entirety, whether it's a human self or a donkey self or a fish self or some other animal cell. Unlike infants, adult animals also form attachment relations and these relations also have a regulatory function. An optimal dynamic will influence the psychobiological regulation in a positive way. It will maximize positive arousal states and minimize negative ones, prevent understimulation and overstimulation, and generally keep us in an optimal arousal zone. So essentially, attachment relations continue to influence and sustain animals on multiple psychophysiological levels, which are affected when loss occurs and the animal is left without a core regulator. And depending on how intertwined these levels are in a dyad, in, in a relationship, how dependent I am on the various levels, on the lost person, then you can have a cumulative effect that can bring the organism to collapse. And that can be very difficult and it can lead to complicated grief, even death. death. So we have two different types of grief, um, uncomplicated or normal grief and complicated grief, which is also known as complex grief, unresolved grief and prolonged grief. I think that's all. I think there's another term for it. Then uncomplicated normal grief, an animal would go through an acute stage that would last for a certain period of time, you know, very substantially between individuals, and the grief <clears throat> would then start to recede. Whereas in complicated grief, the individual is somehow unable to reach closure and the grief just drags on and on. Basically, one becomes stuck. Like you can know cognitively and intellectually and whatever, that the person is dead, but that knowledge is not going to help much because these things run much deeper. And I believe that many non-human animals, especially those in captivity, including companion animals, may be vulnerable to developing complex grief. There are various situations or conditions that make one more prone to complex grief. And one is when you have merged identities. Animals, may develop merged identities with their human or non-human companion. That is, the self is perceived and lived as part of a duo, as opposed to independently or interdependently. It's not uncommon uh, with human couples, for example, have been together for a long time and haven't spread their emotional investment more broadly. Or if you take a dog whose only companion and attachment figure is the human guardian, it can be very difficult for the dog when the human dies because they literally lose a huge part of themselves. And same with other rescued animals, including in sanctuaries, you know, they normally come from a tough environment. Many have been abused physically and psychologically. And so when they at last find security in someone, you know, a human or another non-human, and this person dies, the loss can be quite traumatic. And this is especially so if the individual becomes attached to one other person only and identities merge. Another condition that favors complex grief is attachment insecurity, as mentioned before, especially the anxious variety. And captive animals don't usually come from a normative species specific upbringing that would promote security of attachment. So the insecure 
anxious style, also known as ambivalent, develops when the caregiver is anxious and unpredictable in their response. They don't have to be abusive. They can be really nice people, but the infant doesn't feel that they're entirely reliable. You know, sometimes they're loving, other times they're harsh, sometimes too engaged, other times too distant. And the infant is not entirely sure what they're going to get when they reach out for them, you know, whether the caregiver is going to be available for what they need them to be available for or not. And as adults, they will, these animals, um, they will likely be anxious and over preoccupied with <clears throat> the availability of the attachment partner. They'll have this deep fear of abandonment. They'll be chronically vigilant about separation. They can become obsessed with the partner and extremely jealous. Essentially, uh, what happens is that the brain becomes wired for clinging. The brain becomes organized in such a way that it chronically searches for cues that will signal that the partner is available. And it quickly detects cues of unavailability. And with such brain organization, when loss happens, you know, through death or, or other modes of separation, you can imagine what, what happens, what follows. The, the brain will keep clinging and the reflective mind has very little power over what the experiential self is doing or feeling. <clears throat> so they did this interesting um, experiment. They, they did brain scans in bereaved humans. And this, um, the, the results were interesting because they show that the brain regions linked to physical and social pain processing activate in both people suffering from non-complicated grief and those suffering from complicated grief. But in people with complicated grief, reward centers also activated. And this is what the researchers brought. So the Addiction relevant aspect of this neural response may help to explain why it, is, why it is hard to resist engaging in pleasurable reveries about the deceased, even though engaging in these reveries may prevent those with complicated grief from adjusting to the realities of the present. We're not suggesting that reveries about the deceased are emotionally satisfying, but rather they may serve as craving responses. And if this obsessive cycle is not broken, it can severely impact upon the individual's long-term psychological and physiological well-being. So this was the core of interpersonal grief. Now, in the book, I briefly discuss grief at a distance, that is the grief for animals we don't personally know, and such grief is enabled by the empathic recognition of other animals as persons of their desire to be and to be well and happy and to not be harmed. And um, this then finds expression in public vigils and in various other forms of activism and rescue. As someone once asked about climate grief, I didn't go there in the book and I honestly don't have very much to say about it at this stage, but I am moving in that direction as an extension of my work on spirituality. And if we have time, just very briefly, I think we do a couple of minutes, uh, because someone may wonder how grief and spirituality connect. And I would have said that they didn't, but then they came together in an interesting way as I was researching all this stuff. And by spirituality, I mean an embodied, pre reflective experience, you know, outside interpretative things and stuff, just embodied. <laughs> So I was thinking about these intimate exchanges between you know, subjects, mothers and babies, lovers and so on, and how the communication and the regulation happen at multiple levels and affect multiple aspects of our being. And we could think of these two subjects as two spaces rather than seeing them as singular or separate entities. And so as we are there cuddling each other, we have this invisible and intangible, but very real and influential arrows of agency traveling back and forth, you know, carrying important information. And within this context, I thought, is it not possible that this is also how we communicate with other implicit agencies around us, that it is all simply an extension of the way our organism as an inherently relational entity communicates and engages with 
the world? And uh, my answer was yes. Um, so I'm currently working on the relation between sensory normativity and well-being, and I suspect this will take me into, into the area of um, climate grief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Great on time as well. Um, obviously, we have time now for uh, any questions or comments. So uh, I can already see quite a few hands going up. And uh, yeah, also, yeah, Lisa, thanks for the virtual applause. It's a bit, it's a bit cumbersome with online talks, isn't it? Because obviously, if we were face to face, we would have uh, applauded, but <laughs> doesn't quite translate into the virtual um, sphere. So let me, um, okay, I did see some hands up, but now they've disappeared. So let's, uh, does anybody have a question or a comment for Taya? Yeah, is that a hand up? Um, Shay. Yeah. yeah, hi. Hi, look, that was just great, Taya, thank you. Um, and having met your sheep and observed their reaction to me, a stranger who just assumed that I could go up and say hello. Um, yeah, there's so much to learn. Um, I have read your book, Enter the Animal, which is quite amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, the good enough mother or the good enough caregiver. Um, are you familiar with the work of Winnicott when he talks about the good enough mother? No, I'm sorry, I'm not. Can not? You, can you, no, no, I, can you hear me? No, I'm not, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, well, next what time is, I is, come yes. to visit, we'll talk about it. Thank you. Um, he was a psychologist who talked about when the actual parents weren't available, mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about humans, but it obviously applies mm -hmm. to animals as well. Mm -hmm. um, whoever takes on that caring role is called a good enough mother. They may not be mm -hmm. perfect, um, mm. they may not be able to pro provide everything, but they provide enough for the, yes. for the child yes. to thrive. That, yeah. Would you say it's the same with, no, would you uh, say it's Yes, yes, animal? it's, it's, it's um, yes, that's what other people say as well. It's better to have someone than to have no one. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, messed up with certain parents, uh, but, um, but it, it is definitely important to have that kind of intimacy, even if it's, you know, bad or if it's not optimal or whatever, it's definitely uh, better because those people that didn't actually have anyone, they were like, they were physically, they were unwell, not just emotionally and cognitively, but even physically, you know, it's just, it affects everything. And um, it is definitely important to have someone. And if it's, if it's, it's in, with interspecies relationships, like I've been following this thing on Facebook called Peggy and Molly in Australia. And Molly is a magpie who was found wounded and abandoned in someone's garden. And the humans took it in to help it heal. But their dog, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, fell in love with the bird and has now created the nurturing. Um, mm. Not that humans aren't, but I just think the interspecies companionship. It's, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be the same species. No, absolutely. Um, uh, look, I mean, like, it's is, easier if it's the same species, it's easier, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that one learns from, you know, to how to be in the world, you know, how to behave yeah. socially, but also in terms of uh, where to get food, like, okay, we go to the supermarket, but if we were raised by a dog, then the dog wouldn't know to go to the supermarket. Okay, that's a bit silly as a comparison, but, you know, like animals, that's part of the problem with rehabilitation of, uh, or, of orphan or raise an orphan wildlife you know because people just put them in a cage there um, because they try not to humanize them as they say and they leave them there and then when they're old enough they, they just dump them somewhere you know in the middle of the bush and whatever and it's basically not good because they're not going to survive you know they yeah. don't have any skills they don't know the territory that's why it's really important that you know people do staged release so that and yeah, start right. to get a little bit more accustomed to the environment and you know which expands you know with time and it's, it's got to be done slowly and properly there's something that mimics you know normative 
upbringing because that's just not good enough and it's practiced all over the place but you know in part i understand this i'm not criticizing rescuers because they're overwhelmed there's so much you know like when i was on the wires this uh, um, local um rescue wildlife rescue organization i was receiving like 10 emails a day now that's a lot you know so it's not their fault i mean they, they can't do it physically but you know in principle it's really not a good idea and um and those mm. animals are not going to do well, most of them. You know, occasionally someone will, but yeah. So, and we like we and this in, interspecies friendships are really interesting. We had a wild rabbit that came to see our sheep, and he was playing with the or she, I don't know what gender he was. And the rabbit would come every day, and he was playing with Jason, especially, you know, running around Jason, going up on his hind legs and scratching his nose. And he was just amazing. He was a wild rabbit, just living around here so yeah mm. thank mm. you thank you right, would anybody else like to ask a question or make a comment is there anything in the chat I might ask a question then. Uh, Teo, I saw that the slide at the end there with, I think it was the animal equality group and the way in which that they have used um, dead animals in their activism. Yeah, this was what? actually Animal Liberation Victoria, oh. but oh, okay. was, I think the first such demonstration um, vigil was done in Peru, I think. Right. And then somewhere else. Yes, and they Spain. Use I, I know it's animals. been in Spain. I think that's why I said animal equality because I think they they have mm. done it in Spain. Mm. Just wondering what what you think of that as a activist um, strategy, and what it's trying to tap into. I I've found it very moving, especially when they put it up on YouTube or somewhere, you know, with with uh, lovely music, but. I, I, I try not to have opinions unless some, you know, someone does something that's really not cool because sometimes people do that for various reasons. I try not to have an opinion about people's activism because um, I think it's important to have a variety because it just reaches different people. And I used to be very uh, strict about, you know, what an activist should do, how a vegan should be and stuff like that. But uh, with time, I sort of relaxed a little bit because I, you know, just realized that people are very different and we do, you know, not different things touch us. And I didn't have a problem uh, with that because they did use, you know, they didn't kill the animals to, to, uh, to do the vigil. They, they used animals that were already dead. Um, and I don't know. Do, do you have a problem with that? Is that what you're asking? No, no, I was just interested in it. I've been interested in that for a while. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, also I think they, they mix together um, animals which would kind of conventionally be defined as companion animals and then animals which would be conventionally mm -hmm. defined as farmed animals. Mm -hmm. And that for me is quite an interesting um, I guess, mm. way of I've, yeah. trying to provoke thinking. Yeah. Generally speaking, I find, find this vigil very important because I think it is important for, you know, the rest of the public to actually witness our suffering as well as, you know, to, to kind of normalize this kind of attitude that we have towards other animals as opposed to just the instrumentalizing attitude that is, you know, general yeah. out there. So to see us suffer, and I think that's quite important to be out there with our grief. It's very taxing though on people, you know, like people who do uh, those road vigils and, you know, slaughterhouse vigils and stuff and just seeing animals being trapped in there. That's, yeah. that's I, I don't think many people last for very long. I mean, it's great that they're doing it, but it is very difficult mm -hmm. to witness that constantly. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else like to ask a question? So, uh, Hong Su? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Thea, for the you know such an inspirational uh, research sharing. Uh, you briefly touched upon about spirituality in terms of uh, practicing climate grief. I would mm -hmm. love to hear more about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> like um, <laughs> I have this um, whole chapter of the book on spirituality, and uh, it's basically as I was saying in the end. Um, I, I, I'm talking about, um, I, I make a different um, dif distinction between spirituality and religion. I'm really looking at that very intimate embodied aspect of spirituality, the, the immediate communication with agencies. I'm an atheist, just, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, I'm, I'm talking about agencies that the body can feel like, I don't know, you go into a room and or a house or a place or whatever, and it feels good or it feels bad, or it's like your body, your organism is communicating with things in the environment constantly. And so I'm kind of looking at uh, that aspect and uh, what that signifies for well-being, especially, and how a normative environment may facilitate such communication and what that may and i'm actually I, I just said some basic theoretical stuff in the book and i'm kind of going into this research a bit more more deeply now with this um, um environmental normativity especially and you know what what it actually means to animals to be you know in in a completely foreign environment you know, in a barren cage or even if in a barren paddock and stuff and um and how uh, i'm sorry i'm gonna it's um um so it's 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 that kind of it's it's the sort of the feeling of bliss or dread or whatever that is pre pre-reflective it's like kind of before we start to think about it um in terms of you know what that may mean you know where it may come from but it's that immediate experience that i'm looking into there is um there are a couple of papers out already if you want to read those instead of going into the book uh one is from 2017 it's called uh spiritual animal and another one is uh, open access this one is an open access but i can send it to you um the other one is called place attachment uh because i looked into place attachment as a possible origin of um this, this spiritual relating and animals and that's in humanimalia in the journal humanimalia i think was published in 2020 but that's that one if you look at that one then you'll get a better idea of what it's about but it's kind of complex to explain in a sort of but it, essentially i was saying that um spirituality is a kind of organismic like grief is an organismic response to loss and spirituality is an organismic response to agencies in the environment and I define agent as something that acquires agency by way of having an effect on us, the phenomenon or whatever it is, it doesn't have to have independent agency, like a rock, you wouldn't think of a rock having independent agency, but it's, if it affects us in some way, then it becomes an agent. And that's how I define agency in this context. But it's, it's probably a bit messy to, to just try to kind of explain this in bits and pieces. But if you look at that article, um, that's, that's a bit more uh, integrated. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. I think we have time for any more um, questions or comments. Uh, Fenella? Hello, sorry, I'll just get the picture somewhere. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. I've really enjoyed it. And something that just caught my eye was about mourning being a, a privilege in a more stable environment. And that's something I hadn't thought about at all, but of course it does work. And if you do have a minute to talk about that a bit more, I'd love it. Thanks. Well, um, I don't really have very much to say other than I, I think that that's kind of true because you know if you're I mean I was reading about all this um, 
societies, I wouldn't say cultures, and some are sort of cultural things, others are just societies. Like I was reading about this uh, people in a very poor, um, it was basically, it was a slum in, in Brazil. And, you know, they had lots of kids and most, I mean, at least half of them died. And, um, and then there are some other places. So I was reading about these people who, who, you know, had constant losses and how you just can't, you just can't spend much time <laughs> sitting around and trying to get over your grief because, well, you have to work, you have to look after those who are, you know, still alive. You can't just, you know, talk to your boss and say, look, I, you know, need a month off or three to, to get over my grief or work through my grief. Can I you know, get my salary anywhere? You know, <laughs> most don't even have access to say psychiatrist or whoever may be able to help them not even you know basic medic medical care and so you know most animals in, including human animals live in in very different situations that we you know the weird western <laughs> we call the weird so I went for the paper about the weird western industrialized educated uh rich and and, and democratic was supposed to be a tiny slice of the human societies but a lot of the time we set ourselves as the norm because we're the, the ones writing about all this stuff and uh, <laughs> it is kind of interesting and so like a lot of people including humans not just animal people I mean other animal people live in in in, in very difficult situations and uh, you just can't afford to to be too miserable because um you know like you know what happens if you get depressed you know it's hard to work it's um it's hard to do anything and there's this um kind of cultural tendency motivation to just get over it as soon as you can i don't really know if that well that affects people in the end you know when they get old whether if they do <laughs> you know whether um it actually helps to get rid of stuff or it just suppresses stuff. Um, I don't know, but I, yes, I do kind of believe that it's a bit of a privilege in some ways. Yeah, it makes perfect sense actually. And you get it back into a sort of wartime where there's mm. no possibility of mourning and therefore you get back to your vulnerability uh, of predators. I mean, fear of predators, mm -hmm. that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, it was so interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, I know you've you've typed a question, but maybe do you just want to read it out as well? Yeah. I can do. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That was really interesting. I'm really interested in attachment styles anyway, but I've not heard anybody specifically, um, you know, talk about it in um, in reference to animals. Um, so I found that really interesting. I was just wondering, um, like you just mentioned then something about a Western norm, and this kind of ties into that. Um, just thinking about like how Deval mentions how researchers from cultures not influenced by Cartesian philosophy, you know, so animals as machines being mm. less hampered by by um, thinking about animal emotions. And, you know, I think he talked about um, Japanese ethologists um, accepting quite clearly that animals have emotions and a range of emotions. And I'm just wondering, like, have you come across um, researchers from different cultures talking about this in a different way? or like with the move towards kind of more decolonizing um, research, do you feel like it's becoming more acceptable or? Yeah, and, and also just specifically thinking about um, different cultural approaches to this. Um, and different yeah, I actually, um, I mean, there is definitely more openness. There has been more openness um, outside all well, the scientific and philosophical circles still it's almost hard to say western because you know when we talk about sort of mainstream science and stuff it's spread around the world and so it's uh, you know it's the same and i'm sure that it was equally yeah, totally. important to not talk about animal subjectivity in india um in japan if you were you know like a an ethologist or a brain scientist and it was in england so but um yes i mean they're you know, this is just one, it, it is the dominant view, it has been a dominant view, but it is changing. And I don't know, if um, I'm not sure that it's changing because we're becoming more, we, <laughs> the West, whatever, is becoming more open, you know, to 
others i mean like obviously we are trying to be more open well i'm trying to be in a lot of you know uh, people working uh, in veganism and you know social justice are trying to give voice or you know allow others to, to have their voice heard but um it's um i, I think it's more I don't know, something's starting to happen that it, it was perhaps even inevitable, like it couldn't lie for, you know, um, for much longer. Like they were, they were doing this research on animal fear. You know, the guy is very famous for research and fear in animals. He apparently doesn't believe that animals um, uh, feel fear. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's torturing them with fear there. But, but I think that people are, uh, have started you know to to kind of see that it really just doesn't make sense and a lot of a lot of i think it's you know like when you have a system that's oppressive and you can't talk about it then a lot of people are not going to talk about it because you know they're going to lose jobs they're going to lose reputations i mean it was as late as 1997 i think was an academic published a warning in in the journal science um, uh, directed at young researchers who were thinking of, 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 of doing writing about animal subjectivity in any way to not do it unless they have a, a, a job, a tenure, you know, a solid position somewhere. So it was, it was like any other oppressive system, I guess. And then it just started to collapse because it didn't make sense anymore. And there was, you know, pressure to move on. I don't, I don't have an answer, obviously, but, uh, and I guess it helps, always helps to have uh, different views, different approaches that are already there and available. I think that's why it's important to have a lot of vegans around, you know, because someone goes, oh my God, this is happening to other animals. I didn't know, what do I do now? And if you have a leaflet there and a few recipes and go, well, let's start here, Let, you know, make this for dinner instead of something else. Well, you know, when things are already around, then, you know, you can just sort of point to people or they, it's easier for them to kind of feel like, oh, okay, this is, this already exists. This is not, you know, something new, impossible to do. And I think it did help to have, you know, indigenous cultures that look at things differently and so on. But I don't really know how it worked, why, how we got over, or how we are slowly getting over that trap. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for that. And that was that's quite insightful about the the really explicit warnings. Um, mm. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Richard, you're muted. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think we might have reached a, a natural end of the discussion. Uh, so I want to um, finish by thanking Teo very much for a really interesting talk and this will this session will be recorded and available on YouTube with, within a few weeks time, I, I should imagine. And uh, so thanks, thanks everybody for coming along and yeah we have three more talks this year, and if you please do follow up um, Teo's work I right at the top of the chat, there are some links um, to her website and to her book as well. Okay, so thanks very much. Thank you.